Welcome back, everybody. We're glad you're here. If you don't know me, my name is David. I'm one of the pastors here at Community Church. Before we get started today, um, I just want to say a quick thank you. And this will probably be the last time we address that it's our new space, our new space, our new space. But it is our new space. And we've been here for, what, three weeks? And we spent three months working on it. And um, I just want to say a quick thank you to a few people that have made this space possible. The people that, that, that put the seats down that you're now sitting in, okay? Thank you to Tom Steffen. Thank you to David Butler and Don Steiner, Aaron Johnson and Ben Campbell, John Ruck, Nate Fredenberg, Pastor Allen, multiple community groups and discipleship groups and the new city leadership team, just to name a few. There's no way that we could be here sitting in these seats with these lights and this little stage um, without the sacrifice that you put in over the past three months. And, uh, and so can we just do a quick round of applause for those folks? And if you know them, if you know them, give them a hug, say thank you, um, and, and next time we do a project like this, maybe ask yourself, how can I be a part of making this happen? So thanks again to everyone who played a role. I can't wait to see, and we're already seeing, but I can't wait to see how God uses the space. You know what I'm saying? It's been an amazing, an amazing season. So it's time for the word. If you have your Bibles, why don't you get them out? We're going to be looking at uh, Ezekiel chapter 37 today, and we're going to be reading it from the NLT. We study from the ESV, but we're going to be reading it from the NLT. So if you have it on your phones, make sure you switch. So Ezekiel is the book of the Old Testament, the OT. Um, It was written between 590 and 570 BC by a prophet named? Good. All right, you're good. And it was written during a pretty rough time in Israel's history, Israel being God's people from the Old Testament. See, they went from being this powerful nation to being occupied and kicked out of their land and and living as exiles in Babylon. Earlier in Ezekiel, before this this chapter, um, it says that, that this happened because Israel polluted their land with murder that they polluted their land with murder and the worship of idols. And Israel turned from the Lord. They turned from God to follow their own way. So God scattered them, exiled them to live among the surrounding nations of Assyria and Babylon. Now, when they were living in exile, though, nothing really changed. They, They didn't really learn their lesson from the exile. They continued to bring shame to themselves and to God, so much so that even the nations, the occupying nations, began to badmouth God based on the actions of Israel. Questioning if God, if their God was really God. I think we see some of that in our own lives today, don't we? And so God says to Israel in response, God says, listen up, I'm going to rescue you again. I'm going to bring you back to your promised land again, but not because you deserve it. Not because you've done anything more than hurt me, but because my reputation is at stake. I'm going to save you. I'm going to bring you back so all the world will know who I really am and what I'm capable of. And that's where today's passage kicks in, as Ezekiel shares with Israel, with God's people, with us, in exile, a vision God gave him for their future. And so this is verse 1 from Ezekiel 37. It says this, The Lord took hold of me, and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground, and they were completely dried out. These were very dead bones, okay? And then he asked me, Son of man, can these bones become living people again? O sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life and then you will know that I am the Lord. 
So I spoke this message just as he told me. Suddenly as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley, and the bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Verse 8, then, I, then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones, then skin formed to cover their bodies, but they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath from the four winds, breathe into these dead bodies so they may, what, live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me, and breath came into their bodies. They all came to life and stood up on their feet a great army. Then he said to me, he said, son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They represent my people. And they're saying we have become old. We've become dry bones. All our hope is gone. Our nation is finished. Therefore, this is the good stuff. Therefore, prophesy to them and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh, my people, I will open your graves. I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And when this happens, oh, my people, you will know that I am Lord. I will put my spirit in you and you will live again and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I am the Lord. We've heard that a lot. Don't, then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. For the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at this passage with one primary question in mind, a question that we've been talking about for the past six months to a year, and that is, what do you believe God can do? Say it with me. What do you believe God can do? Good. What do you believe God can do in you? In this city, in your family, in this church, what do you really believe that God is capable of? Not on paper, not in theory, but really. Because it seems like every day, just like in Ezekiel, every day, God's reputation, his name, and his authority is publicly questioned and mocked, right? And this book, God's Word, for most intelligent and reasonable people, has become nothing more than a good story, or, or, or better yet, a moral fairy tale. And this questioning, this mocking, it affects us, it affects us just like it did the people of Israel in exile. And maybe, maybe it's not so much in what we say we believe or confess, but deep down, seeds of doubt are planted. And it leaves us asking that same question we just did, that same question but with a different tone. What, what do I believe God can do? What do, what do I believe God can do in me and in my city and in my family and my church? What, what do I believe God can do? And so we start to doubt. We start to question and we doubt and we question. But it's important for you to hear and remember and recognize that even through our doubt, our questioning and our uncertainty, the truth of God is never affected by what we think. God remains constant and present through the doubt, through the questions and unbelief, and God is here working through, through it all, and he wants your attention. Just like in the passage, saying to Ezekiel and to Israel and to all the haters in Babylon and in America and and in Oshkosh, to all the haters, you want to know? You want to know who I am? You want to know what I can do? You want to know how capable I really am? Fine. 
fine, just watch me. Watch me raise the dead to life. Then you'll know. Then you'll know that I am God. And that's where we're hanging out for the next couple of weeks. Talking about the dry bones in all of us, in our city, in our families, in our church that God wants to bring back to life, not because we deserve it, but because it reveals to the observing world the truth of who God is. As Ezekiel writes, then we will know that he is God. And that really is the goal. That's our mission, and it always has been. Ever since humans were created in the garden, in God's image, we were designed and assigned to represent God out in the world because God wants all the world to know him. God wants all to be restored back to him. And listen, listen, miracles, miracles are just part of that mission. They are a means to an end. They are the actions that flow out from the heart of God so we will know who he is. So we will know that he is God. And this is my prayer for you in the series. Dry bones. Not just that you would feel restoration, that you would feel hope and a renewed plan for your future, but that in the process, in the miracles, that you would come to a more complete understanding of who God is. It's going to be good. Let's pray as we get started. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we believe that you are real and that you're going to do something amazing in here today. And God, we believe that you're, going to, that you're going to work through the miraculous, doing things that only you can do so we might know that you are God. And we thank you in advance for all that, you, that you'll do over the next couple weeks as we study this passage. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a cool graphic, isn't it? Do you kind of catch it? Let me show you. So in the background, it's a destroyed city. You probably can't see the, all the detail, but it's like a destroyed city. And then there's this human silhouette with, with new life growing through it, okay? Dry bones coming to life. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, a little over a year ago, story time, a little over a year ago, before we knew anything about this place, um, I felt promptings from God that it was time to invest. It was time to plant and to take part in, in fixing what's broken. And th- this has been an ongoing passion for me over the past few years. And there were times in this, in this pursuit, in this, in this uh, prompting, there were a few times with spaces that I talked myself into believing that this was it. This is where we need to invest. See, there was this cool place on Washington Street. Um, Some of you walked through it with me. Um, Beautiful windows. It's an old church. Really cool space. But tons of mold in the basement, okay? So we had to walk away. Then there was the Wagner Opera House. Anyone remember the Wagner? We started talking about that. Um, It was great. Really cool. Um, But just before we moved in, before we we occupied, we learned a few things that, that made it so we couldn't. And this was actually a really disappointing time for me, a really hard time in my life, um, because we had to walk away again. And then there was one more, and this is the one that, that I really liked. It was the old Eagles Club across from the YMCA uh, downtown. It is so cool. It's incredible. It's an amazing space. And, and we spent a lot of time thinking about it, um, but it needed some work, and the utilities were like crazy expensive, okay? Like $8,000 a month expensive, And so if anyone's interested in buying it, great, but have fun with the utilities. And so once again, I had to walk away. I had to walk away. Anyway, um, I remember sitting one day in my car in front of the Eagles Club, actually, and it was raining, and I was just praying and dreaming and, and reading through this passage, actually, from Ezekiel 37, and and I knew that we were meant to invest. I knew that we were meant to care for something and repair something. But it had been a while since I really felt anything specific, any clarity. And so I just kind of sat there in my car in the rain outside waiting to hear something, anything really. And I waited and, and I read it again thinking, you know, maybe if I read it one more time, then God will answer me. 
but nothing. And so, so I, I sat there for like an hour, and I don't know why. Maybe some, somehow I thought that like an hour was that perfect magic, hear from God amount of time to sit in the quiet, you know, but, but nothing. And so I left there kind of frustrated, like, what the heck? I wonder how many of you <laughs> have prayed or read or questioned or asked for advice or, or direction or any of that stuff only to be left waiting. Anyone? Yeah. So I went home, and uh, I got ready for this worship night. Some of you were probably there at our other location. It's called Oasis. And, um, and I was looking forward to it, but I was totally in a mood. And I, and I just couldn't shake it. I felt off. And so anyway, I got there, and the music started, and I was just kind of hanging out, still in a mood, um, just hanging out. Songs were great. Lights were great. Everything was great. And then I, heard, I, I just kind of heard something. And I don't know, I don't know if I audibly heard it um, or if it was just in my head or my heart, um, but I heard God speak. And, and I know this doesn't happen often, uh, at least not for me, and I wish it happened more, and maybe I need to sit in my car more. <laughs> but I heard God, God say something. He said, David... Relax. Stop trying to make me move. And he said, be still and know. And that, and that, that phrase usually finishes with be still and know that I'm God, yeah. And it was on this loop in my head, right? It was be still and know, be still and know. And so I sat, I sat and I was still. And then the song started up. It was like halfway through, and a song that we've sung a lot here. It's called The Great I Am. And we hit the second verse, and as soon as it started, I felt like this urgency to listen, to really focus and pay attention. Like how God went from speaking to me to singing over me, which is a real thing, by the way. Zephaniah chapter 3. So I heard these words from God to me really from God to us. I heard these words and it was, I want to be near, near to your heart, loving the world, but hating the dark. Come on. I want to see dry bones living again, singing as one. And that was it. And then we all kicked back in with hallelujah, holy, holy, God almighty, the great I am, who is worthy, none beside thee, God almighty, the great I am, yeah, yeah. And in that moment, in that miracle, I was able to understand just a bit more of who God is and what his dreams are for me and for you and this city and his family and your church. This dream we see supported all throughout scripture that God wants to take what's broken and fix it. What's lost and find it what's dead, and bring it back to life so we might know him, so we might know that he is God Almighty, the great I am. Yeah, see? And there is no one too lost to be found. There is no one too broken to be fixed or too dead inside to be brought to life. What better example than what we just read here in Ezekiel? starting in verse 4, saying, dry bones. Listen to the word of the Lord. This is the sovereign Lord, the great I am, saying, look, I'm going to put breath into you. I'm going to make you live again. You were dead, but now you're alive. I'm going to put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I'm going to put breath on you. And then you will know, then you will know me. Then you will know that I am 
the Lord. Isn't that an incredible image? God speaking to a people who turned away, to a nation in disgrace and doubt, a nation who forgot who God is. And he says, you are as dead as dead can be. All that's left of you are these dry bones. But because I am who I am, I'm not going to let you stay this way. I'm going to put you back together. I'm going to build you up. I'm going to breathe into you new life. I'm going to raise you from the dead so you know who I am. So you know that I am God. So you remember the real me. I believe God has some work to do in us today, friends. This message from Ezekiel to Israel, it might actually extend past the exile and into Oshkosh. And just like the dry bones in the valley, I think some of us need to do some recognizing and some remembering today. And not just where we've been, but where we've been brought Paul says this really well in his letter to the church, Ephesus, first century, just after Jesus. This is chapter 2. He says, says, once you were dead, you were dry bones. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. Verse 3, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. This is where we've been. Never forget where you come from. But don't get stuck there, friends. Because, verse 4, because God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us What? Yeah. He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. It's only by God's decision and his character and his love and his grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. It's only because of God. His name, his grace, his reputation, his power, his authority, and his lordship over all the earth that we have been saved. That we have been brought from death to life, from dry bones to living again. And this is where we are now. This is where we have been brought to, all because God wants to be near to us, all because God wants us to know him. That we would recognize and remember. We all need to recognize and remember. Uh, We're going to be finishing up in just a minute. The band wants to come up. They did such an awesome job this morning. All right, so let's go back to that original question. The question of the series, if God can take dried bones and bring them to life, what do you believe God can do in you? Not on paper, but in real life. Because I think some of us, even though we've been raised from death to life, even though we're with Jesus, we still somehow self-identify as dry bones. The walking dead instead of the born again. (laughs) Like somehow your bones were just a little too dry for God to fully restore. Or your past was just a little too bad for the miracle to work. And Jesus' sacrifice on the cross made complete with the empty grave. It, It wasn't quite enough to cover your sin. I wonder how many of you are in that place this morning 
doubt and question. You're following Jesus, but still feeling and believing like dry bones. I've been there. We've all been there. But if that's you today, feeling totally unworthy and unlovable, you need to take a moment to sit in the car with the rain, to be still, and to remember the miracle. To remember who God really is. And you need to let it go. You need to remember his grace is sufficient for you. Through it all, his grace is enough. To be still and to know. But maybe, maybe you came here today and you're just kind of on the fence with church and God and the whole thing. Like, maybe you just had a kid um, or you just got married or you just went through something kind of wild. Hopefully it wasn't getting married or having a kid, but... It probably was. But anyway, uh, you made it here because you're trying to make some sense out of things. You're trying to find some direction. And so you stop by church hoping, hoping for some help. And you're not really sure what you believe exactly. The stories are cool. The moral fairy tales help connect some dots. But in the end, if you're honest, if you're really honest, you just, you just don't know. You weren't sure. You feel lost or like Israel in that passage where all hope is gone. Well, if that's you today and you know who you are, it's probably been all of us at one point. You know who you are. I believe. Listen, I, need, I believe with all of my heart that God is trying to reach out to you. That he wants you to know him and what he's capable of. That he is rich in mercy and loves you so much even with all your history and your past and your mistakes and your sin and your disbelief all of it God wants to set you free from it God wants to give you a new life full of grace and freedom and love and peace and he wants you he wants to do this so you might know him just like Ezekiel said that you would know that he is Lord that you would recognize that he is Lord over everything, even over this moment. If that is you, I just implore you to say, God, I, I believe that you're real and I believe that you can and will take my dry bones and breathe new life into them. That you can and will do a miracle in me in this very moment so I could come to know the real you. The real you. Take a step today, friends. We need to recognize and we need to remember this morning that God is God and he has gone to great lengths so we might know him. We all need to recognize and remember that God literally brought heaven to earth so our dry bones could live again. So moving forward, what, what do you believe God can do in you. After all, he's already done the impossible. What do you believe God can do? Can he, can he set you free from your addictions? Yes, he can and he will. Can he break your chains of doubt and guilt and insecurity? Yes, he can and will. Can he finally heal your broken heart, showing you how to love and forgive to give and receive grace. Yes, he can and he will and he wants to start right now. So let's just take a moment in the quiet, in my car outside the Eagles Club with the rain coming down to be still. To be still and know, to be still and recognize and respond saying, you can take these dry bones and breathe life into my skin. Take me as I am. You called me by name. Raise me to life again. He wants to start right now. 
So let's be still. Let's be still and know that he is God. We're just going to take a minute to just hang out. It's hard in our, in our culture as we're reaching for our phones and all that, but let's just take a moment to be still and to listen. The band is going to come in singing in a minute. Um, let's just sit. <laughs> 